I help the youngest is the chief protector. George Square is lit up with a flickering light, hundreds of candles as the pro life vigil has taken place here, organised by the Society for the Protection of Unborn Children. The people have been saying the rosary and now they're moving off in quiet contemplation to the service in the cathedral. And the theme coming through has been the value of human life. Oh, sorry. Hello? Yeah, yeah, I'm just making the report for the uh, pro-life vigil at George Square. What, is it anything to do with racism? No, it's nothing to do with racism. LGBT? No, no. No, it's nothing to do with refugees. Or climate change. No, it's not about it's about the number one children. Nothing to do with climate change. Well, no, no, there's no vandalism. There's no violence. Spray paint over anything. No, they haven't spray. No, there's no spray paint over anything. No. Well, you're not interested. You want me to stop here? All right, OK. So that was last night in Glasgow. Fantastic. The reason I wanted to go was I'd seen pictures of it from last year. Hundreds and hundreds of people in George Square. I wanted to be there. So I went along and it was great. Uh, went the cathedral afterwards, Glasgow Cathedral was absolutely packed uh, as well. Had a little chat with John Deegan, the CEO of Spuck. Uh, he's always full of good ideas. It's interesting to see what they've got up their sleeve next. It was nice to meet the Bishop of Paisley, have a quick chat as well. Glasgow Catholic Cathedral well, as well is really, really beautiful. Anyway, so that's that. But yesterday was a busy day for the Scottish Family Party because in the afternoon, one of the things we did was went along to the Scottish Trans Alliance's protest outside the Scottish Parliament. They were, well, they weren't protesting, demonstrating because the Gender Recognition Act that they want is going to, was being passed by the MSPs at the time. So when we arrived there, parked the car, started taking the placards out of the car, and the police came over, they said, oh, are you here? You know, the Scottish Family Party. And the policeman said, could you go and set up over there? Pointing to the front of the Parliament, like miles away from where the Scottish Trans Alliance was. Well, I said, yeah, well, we'll set up there for our pro-life uh, demonstration later on. But we're just going to go over to the uh, Scottish Trans Alliance demonstration first. And just, you know, stand at the edge with our placards and make our presence for there. He, he, the policeman said, no, we'd like you to come over here. I said, well, that, that part of what we've come for is to go, no, I'd like you to stand over here. Uh, and I said, well, really, you know, it is okay to go and counter-protest at someone else's event. That's something that happens. That is okay. And if, I mean, the policeman didn't really, he sort of went backwards about three times, but then he, he said, you know, okay, that was fine. And over we went, and that was okay. So we had our giant placards. Uh, some of the, the people there tried to cover them up with their flags and this, that, and the other. Um, our placards were so big that if we stand on the like on the concrete seats that are there, you can hold them so high that no one could really get anything uh, over them. Um, someone had their placards spat at. We had all the usual uh, abuse. It's interesting with these events. Sometimes the people that are really having to go at you, they try to come over as so nice. They sort of, I, I'm a loving and caring type of person. Why do you have to be so full of hatred? And they really try and come over like that. But then they can't keep it going. And before you know it, they're spitting obscenities at you again. Then a few minutes later, they're trying to do the, if only you were the kind and caring person like I am. I mean, it's, it's quite quite amusing to see sometimes. Now, I had quite a few people come up to me. I was holding the Man Can't Become a Woman simple placard. A few people came over and, uh, and chatted. And a couple of them said, what about left-handedness? In the olden days, when you weren't allowed to be left-handed, they used to tie your hand behind your back. There were hardly any left-handed people. But now it's free and left-handedness is accepted in our society. There are far more people identifying as left-handed, or however they put it. So how do you respond to that? Well, the first response is that that is an argument from analogy. It's saying the thing we're talking about, transgenderism, is similar to left-handedness in some ways. Therefore, what applies to that in that case is true in this case. The problem with arguments from analogy is that they just don't work. It's a form of logical fallacy. It's like, you know, grass is green, uh, mint ice cream is green, therefore you need to cut mint ice cream uh, with a lawnmower every week or it grows too long. I mean, that's an example of an, an argument from analogy. But think as well, in what sense is left-handed and right-handedness similar to 
male and female, being a man or a woman. Well, there's sort of some parallels with some really important differences. As there are left and right-handed, people are ambidextrous as well. Some people are mixed. They might be right-footed but left-handed, etc. So I think there's some uh, important differences there. But looking at the analogy they're trying to make, what used to happen with left-handedness is people who were born left-handed, people tried to make them into right-handed when they actually weren't. Um, that's a bit like people who are, for example, born as a man, but then trying to make themselves into a woman. Could that be the analogy as well? So it's a, a very weak argument, but quite a few people were coming up with that one as though it was the killer blow in the discussion. I've heard quite a bit of the usual, you're saying we don't exist type line. To which I'd always say, well, obviously that's not true. No one's saying you don't exist. I mean, you're standing in front of me, but that's an example where what we are actually saying doesn't sound bad enough. So they have to make up a worse, make up something that we're not saying in order to justify the hostility uh, towards us. So we had that a few times. I had an interesting chat with um, what would be called a trans woman, basically you know, a man who thought he was one. And we had quite a long chat. And at one point he said to me, do, do you think I'm a woman? I said, no, I, I believe you're a, you're a man. And he said, do you think I'm mentally ill? I said, I, I, I do believe it's a, you know, a psychological problem that you've got. I mean, the, the person was quite reasonable, actually. I mean, they weren't ranting and raving, but the police were standing just behind me. And I was thinking, if this person just decides to go and tell the police what I've just said, or if the police overheard this, I mean, how would this, uh, how would this play out? I wasn't quite sure. But anyway, that was all very, uh, very interesting. The police didn't intervene at all. But the one thing I would say I noticed at the trans rally, I've noticed this at them before, that this atmosphere of sort of forced joy, we're going to bang the drums and cheer and all be really, really, really happy because we're really determined to be and we want to show everyone that we're happy. But it just rings hollow to me. It rings hollow. When you meet the individuals there, they're often a bit mixed up, very hostile, angry, and don't give the impression that life's heading in a positive direction. Now, of course, the Gender Rec Recognition Act uh, reform bill was passed, needless to say. Uh, John Mason voted against it, as expected. He also congratulated Ash Reagan, the SNP cabinet minister who resigned over it. John Mason congratulated her for that. Uh, that's uh, not going to go down too well at head office, but anyway, that's what happened. The arguments put forward against the reform of the Gender Recognition Act, they generally all came from the feminist direction. We don't want men in our spaces because men are bad. So the last thing we women want is men. Okay. Now, I'm not saying there's nothing in those arguments. I mean, you know, we quite agree. We don't want men in you know, women's toilets or whatever. Okay. And yes, there is a risk of, of abuse and, and sexual assault or whatever. So we quite agree with those. But the real issue, as far as we're concerned, with the Gender Recognition Act is the ideology. It's promoting the ideology that changing gender is normal, natural, and healthy. So it's something that someone can do. It's, an, it's, an, it's a, an option for you that's open, particularly young people, particularly to children. If that's a road you want to go down, then the government and society are ready to celebrate that and acknowledge it and lead you down that road. Whereas we say that's not a good road to go down. That whole ideology of having a gender identity that's different from your sex, that's just unhelpful. It's unhelpful. It doesn't really make sense to say it's wrong because it's not a truth claim, really. It's just unhelpful. It's confusing. It's unhelpful. And we don't accept it. Right. So after that, the uh, Scottish Trans Alliance, we had our own little gathering in front of the Parliament uh, on the pro-life theme. We had uh, some of our pro-life flags. Our shipload of them coming from China is still on its way, along with family party flags. But again, the flags just look brilliant. They're really very, very striking. We had some new giant placards uh, as well. Now, we're there in front of the Parliament at the invitation of Nicola Sturgeon, because she always says, don't go and hold placards and pray or, or whatever outside abortion clinics. Come and do it at the Parliament. So we took up Nicola Sturgeon's invitation uh, again, and with these events, I feel like we're just getting warmed up with them. So when the flags arrive, we're hoping that this sort of uh, uh, that this sort of demonstration will take place in towns, town squares, town centre. I don't know, I had schools, who knows where, uh, around the country. We're hoping local branches will want to do this sort of thing in the places where you know local people are outside the parliament. It tends to be a lot of tourists and other people are there to demonstrate about something else. Uh, but in local towns, local villages then we'll, we'll meet real 
uh, real people we'll be able to give out our leaflets and let people know about the family party and where we stand. Now, the 40 Days for Life prayer vigil outside the abortion clinic in Edinburgh has been continuing. Lots of stories to tell about that. Uh, my wife, Mary, is going to be telling a few of those stories at the Scottish Family Party Conference. Um, you'll find those extremely uh, interesting, I assure you. But I'll just tell you one. Uh, when I was there, I'm just doing an hour a week. And when I'm there, I'm the leader. There's always one person of the group. There's only like three or four people normally. But one person is the leader. And if anyone approaches the group wanting to talk about something, the leader says, yes, let's have a chat. But you just go around the corner so you don't block the pavement so everyone can get on with their praying. And, you know, it's not so sort of making a scene. So a lady came up and started remonstrating with the group. And I said, oh, right, if you'd like to chat, let's just go around the corner and we can have a chat. She said, I'm not talking to a man. I said, well, I'm, I'm the representative today. I, I'm the leader. And the, the system we've got is that if anyone wants to speak to us, they can have a, a chat to me and say, I'm very happy to talk to you around the corner. No way am I going to talk to a man, not a man. I said, well, OK, if you don't, if you don't wish to talk to me, then nobody is going to talk to you. OK, I mean, that, that, that is our system today. So you know, we're, we're, you know, there's not going to be any conversation there. So she then talked to the women who were there in the group and she said, are you, going, are you going to let this man tell you you're not allowed to speak? So I explained again, well, you know, that's, that's the system we've got today. And so, so that was that. So she then stood there uh, sort of lecturing the group for the best part of an hour. Even though there was virtually no response, she just stood there like mouthing off for the best part of an hour. So my wife and I eventually struck on the idea and she was right up close to us talking at us that we just had a conversation between us. There wasn't really a conversation. We were basically saying to each other the things we wanted her to hear. And so we would speak and she would stop and listen because she'd be curious. Whenever she said anything, we ignored her. And we just had a conversation between us. And she basically heard lots of the things that we would want to say. Uh, that's great. Uh, so that was that. that was one interesting encounter. I've never had anyone do that before though, to stand there talking to the group for so long, even though there was no uh, response. But at the 40 Days for Life Vigil as, as well, you get the same effect. People who come along and say, you're such, you know, you're such horrible people. I'm the kind, caring type of person. I would never do something like you're doing. I would never do that. Absolutely not. I can't imagine how you could be so heartless and unpleasant to do what you're doing. But then before you know it, the mask slips and they're really being snide and offensive, snarling, bad language, whatever. Uh, but then again, they can flip back into this. Oh, I'm, I'm a really nice person, much nicer than, than you are. It, it's just the pattern you see coming up again and again and again. Now, the media coverage for the vigil has sort of died down a bit. We had one uh, article last week in the Times written by a journalist called Poppy Koronka. I use the word journalist in the loosest sense. She's actually a pro-abortion activist. If you look at her Twitter account, for example, that's all that's in it. She's a pro-abortion activist. But as these people find, the Times basically just says to her, would you like to write another uh, opinion piece about your pro-abortion activism, but we'll call it a news report. And that's what happens in, in the other newspapers as well. I mean, this Poppy Koronk, she's written hit pieces about the Stanton uh, Crisis Pregnancy Centre and several about the, uh, the vigil as well. But the latest one she came up with said, uh, US activists pushing unhealthy and unethical abortion reversal pill. That's just a screenshot of the, uh, of the article there. And the article basically gave the impression that the 40 Days for Life vigil in Edinburgh, it's the only one taking place at the moment, that they're pushing the unhealthy and unethical abortion reverse, reversal pill. It was also saying, basically, the activists have been trained to approach people in the street and speak to them, engage them in conversation and try and persuade them not to have abortions or, or, or whatever. So let's, uh, let's have a look at that. Well, let's look at the um, abortion reversal pill first of all. Now, it is true, 40 Days for Life uh, in some countries do. I mean, this is an example of a placard. Uh, they do encourage people to investigate the uh, abortion reversal pill. The way it works is the uh, medical abortion, the two pills, uh, one pill is taken, then a period of time later, the second pill is taken. If a woman changes her mind between the pills, the abortion reversal pill, uh, in many cases, can result in the baby being saved and being born healthy. Um, and, you know, it's obviously a... a uh, a good thing. Now, I'm not an expert about the abortion reversal pill, 
but there was a doctor that was prescribing it or giving it, providing it in any case to women in Britain. And this is a quick report about it. So it says several women who received, uh, received help from Dermot, that's the doctor, spoke out testifying to the care he gave them in many instances resulting in the birth of a healthy baby. Thankfully, just before his case was due to go to the High Court, the General Medical Council reversed the ban against him after concluding that there was no case to act to answer. So because he'd been prescribing this pill uh, that basically saved babies' lives, the General Medical Council started a case against him. Uh, but he's, he's won the case. Uh, Dr. Keeney commented, I'm relieved and delighted to have been exonerated. I've been the victim of a coordinated campaign by senior figures in the abortion industry who have been determined to prevent women in urgent need from accessing re abortion reversal treatment. The whole investigation and the untruths about abortion reversal reported in the media have taken a toll on me and my family. The truth about abortion reversal treatment must now be told and medical professionals who are able and willing to support women with the treatment should be allowed to do so without fear. My hope is that women across the UK will now be told by medical regulators and abortion providers that abortion reversal treatment is safe, that it is available, and that success is possible if they regret uh, their decision to have an abortion and choose to seek help. Right, okay, that's what's going on there. So we've got this sort of total inversion of morality where abortion is regarded as good and providing a pill that will rever reverse it, that will save the baby's life, that's something that's really bad. He should be struck off for doing that. That's something to really embarrass people about. But basically, as far as the 40 Days for Life vigils in Scotland are concerned, in Edinburgh, the suggestion that they're you know, pointing to people towards the abortion reversal pill, it's just not true. It's just not true. That's not part of, of what happens in, uh, in, in Edinburgh, at the vigil. Uh, he also, uh, she also said that participants have been trained like, to approach people in the street and top them, stop them and talk to them and encourage them not to have an abortion. Now, as far as I'm concerned, if people are doing that, that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. I think in America, often they are dealing with an abortion clinic. That's all it does. So everyone going in and out, more or less, is there for that reason. In Scotland, it's very, very different from that. The abortions are in facilities that include lots of other services as well. But, uh, I mean, be that as may, it's just a fact that in Scotland, that's not what happens at the vigils. We, we don't approach anyone at all. We only talk to people who talk to us, uh, as long as they're willing to talk to a man. So again, what, but what Poppy Karonka was suggesting was that's what's happening here. Now, technically speaking, it wasn't an outright lie but it was de a deliberately misleading article intended to demonize the vigils uh, in Scotland. Um, because you're saying, this is what the organization is training people to do. And then that was just seamlessly woven in to comment about the vigils in Scotland. But say, we were just given a completely false impression. She claimed that uh, no one from 40 Days for Life had been available to, to comment on it. I mean, Mary's been interviewed by Poppy uh, at least once. So anyway, as far as the Times is concerned, I think that was their worst piece of reporting since they made 19 mistakes uh, reported on my case with the General Teaching Council for Scotland. The worst mistake that was, they made was that they reported that I'd been accused of assaulting Ruth Davidson rather than insulting Ruth Davidson. And just for the record, I was found not guilty of even insulting Ruth Davidson. Right, that's a few uh, few updates from a busy day uh, yesterday. Uh, do get your tickets for our conference. It's going to be brilliant. Too many highlights to mention here, but it's on Saturday the 12th of November up in Dunfermline. Uh, morning and afternoon, there's a, there's a dinner in the evening that you can sign up to as well if you would like to. So do go to the link below and buy your tickets now, and it would be great to see you at our annual conference. Right, thanks for watching.